I think that's the last of it. So today, we are pleased to welcome Abby Smithmeyer, currently a doctoral candidate studying uh, history at West Virginia University, where she also received a master's degree. Abby grew up in Butler, Pennsylvania, attending school at Slippery Rock University for her undergraduate studies. Her dissertation combines cultural, memory, and material culture studies to explore the ways monuments faced vandalism and destruction during and shortly after the Civil War. Her research has been published in the American 19th Century History, Southern Historian, as well as Emerging Civil War. While teaching classes on U.S. history at WVU, Abby's knowledge of the Civil War era has been bolstered by multiple summers at various historical sites and battlefields, including the Seminary Ridge Museum, Fredericksburg and Spotsylvania National Military Park, Petersburg National Battlefield, and most recently at Manassas National Battlefield Park. That's actually where I ran into Abby last year. I was speaking uh, down at historic Brentsville in Prince William County, and I decided to stop by Manassas on my way out of town. And I'm there in the visitor center minding my own business, and I hear someone behind me talking about this monument that had been looted from VMI uh, in 1864 and sent to Wheeling, where I'm from. This monument ended up sitting about a block from my office. And uh, I recognize this because I wrote something about this topic. It was one of the very first things that I wrote for Emerging Civil War many years ago. And I couldn't believe that anyone else knew. I didn't figure anyone read my article, uh, but that someone else knew about it and she knew her stuff. And I was so impressed. And so I begged her that she had to come up here and talk to our second Saturday group. And she graciously agreed. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, Abby Smith-Meyer. Hello, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, thank you to John Eric um, for graciously inviting me. That's definitely the, the one of the best visitor encounters that I've had at Manassas. You can always have some interesting ones for sure. But um, it's a real honor, pleasure to be speaking with you all today. Um, I think any day where you can talk about the Civil War with like-minded people that are interested in the topic is, is a win. Um, I've had plenty of groups that are less than enthused and interested. Yeah, sorry, too short for this. <laughs> Thank you. But um, as as John Eric said, um, my talk today will, will mainly be on various monuments that were either vandalized or, or even destroyed throughout the Civil War era. Um, but I did want to make a quick note that even though this is hopefully going to be the topic of my dissertation. This is a, a relatively new project for me. Um, this is the first time I've, I've really talked uh, or presented on it, other than, you know, talking with some friends and colleagues. So um, it's definitely a work in progress. Um, so go easy on me. Uh, I'm definitely going to use you all as sort of guinea pigs today to test it out. And looking forward to hearing your, your questions and your feedback afterwards. Um, to improve this and, and build on it as I, I progress with this prog uh, project. Uh, to get started, I thought I'd provide a little bit of a roadmap for this talk to give you an idea, a sense of where we're going and what I'll be talking about. So in total, uh, I'm gonna cover seven different monuments or statues, uh, each of them holding significance and meaning to 19th century Americans. Five of these monuments, uh, two Confederate and three Union, were erected during or shortly after the Civil War's conclusion, which makes them uh, some of the earliest monuments uh, ever dedicated to the Civil War um, in this nation. And almost all of these five served as memorials to the fallen dead of the Civil War. They also served as, as symbols of their respective nation, either the United States or the Confederate States of America. And because of that, they helped held deep meaning, power, and significance for, for Civil War Americans. They also held contradictory meaning for these individuals, um, for those in the North and the South, soldiers and civilians alike, which led to um, their uh, vandalism and, and sometimes destruction as well. And their significance and their meaning also changed over time as 19th century Americans moved past the Civil War and into the uh, 20th century, um, their meaning kind of faded into the distance as well. So that's something that I'll, I'll highlight towards the end of the talk with the, the last two monuments. And then I, I mentioned talking about seven monuments. So the other two uh, that I'll be discussing 
were actually dedicated um, and erected prior to the Civil War. However, they both fell victim to vandalism um, during the four years of bloody fighting. The first of which that I'll talk about is was um, a monument dedicated to honor the 1781 uh, surrender of British forces to George Washington at Yorktown, Virginia. And then the second one, um, John Eric kind of hinted at, it's the bronze statue of George Washington that stood at the Virginia Military Institute um, when General David Hunter marched his Union forces through Lexington, Virginia in the summer of 1864. So both of these two became props in the battle um, over which side, either the United States or the Confederacy, uh, were the true inheritors of the founding fathers' beliefs in the revolutionary era's principles of democracy and freedom. And in total, these seven case studies um, help us better understand the importance these items uh, held to 19th century Americans and the significance these monuments held and represented meant that they fell victim um, to uh, soldiers and civilians throughout period. And ultimately, I hope this talk really shows that, you know, we think of monument vandalism and destruction as a, a modern day issue. It's always in the news. It's been a, a hot button topic for the last few years, especially. But really, um, I'm hoping that you'll see that these pieces of material culture, these monuments themselves, invoked emotional reactions, not just today, but in the past. And it, that led to their vandalism by 19th century Americans. And ultimately, this talk will show that the destruction of Civil War monuments is as old as the conflict itself. So with that, I thought I would start um, the talk with the battlefield I spent my past two summers at, um, which is Manassas or Bull Run, as it's interchangeably known. Um, you can see a picture at the top of the slide there of Henry Hill, one of the most famous pieces of, of ground at Manassas National Battlefield Park. And as you all know, uh, the Union saw some pretty early success on the morning of July 21st, 1861. But there was a delay in the fighting, and that gave the Confederates opportunity to regroup and reinforce their position on Henry Hill, which is what is pictured there, and is where the, the visitor center now sits. But there was a, this delay in the fighting uh, allowed for the Confederates to regroup, and about two o'clock in the afternoon, the Union and under the command of McDowell decided that if you really want to see your victory at first Manassas, you need to take Henry Hill, which was uh, named after uh, Judith Henry, who was an 84-year-old bedridden widow, who was actually in her house during the time of the fighting, and she became the, the first known casualty, uh, civilian casualty during the American Civil War, um, because she, she remained in her house. But at about two o'clock in the afternoon, the Union brought their artillery forward to try and dislodge the Confederates off of Henry Hill and move on to capture Manassas Junction a few miles away. But the Confederates um, needed to hold that ground, push the Union off of that position to secure victory as well. And they were in a strong position with General Thomas Jackson and his newly christened Stonewall Brigade forming the center of the Confederate line on Henry Hill. And this line was extended farther to the left by Georgia soldiers under the command of Colonel Francis Bartow, who you see pictured on the slide there in his uh, Confederate uniform. And while his men were progressing and, and charging across Henry Hill to try and dislodge that Union artillery, a shell fragment uh, struck him in the chest and knocked him from his horse. And a Confederate soldier recalled this moment. He said, with both hands clasped, clasped over his breast, Bartow raised his head, and with a godlike effort, his eye glittering in its last gleam with a blazing light, he said with the last heroic flash of his holy spirit, they have killed me, but boys never give up the fight. And despite this loss of leadership and other commanders um, falling killed or, or mortally wounded for the Confederates, uh, they were able to dislodge the Federals off of Henry Hill to secure victory, the first major land battle of the American Civil War. But this became a, a very bloody battle. It was the bloodiest battle in American history up to that point with nearly 5,000 casualties. And so calls were quickly made to honor um, the men who lost their lives at Manassas. 
and newspapers started pushing for the mothers, daughters, and sisters of Georgia to erect a monument to Francis Bartow. However, soldiers in the 8th Georgia who fought under his command acted first. Um, they erected a, a plain white marble monument, six feet long, four feet above ground, and about eight inches in diameter at the top at the place where Bartow fell. And you can see on the slide one of the only images of this monument um, that exists. And on September 4th, 1861, only six weeks after the first battle concluded, there was a dedication ceremony held at Manassas um, to sort of christen this monument. And the original keynote speaker for the event was Vice President Alexander Stevens of the Confederate States of America. However, he had to um, be replaced at the last minute because he was caught up in Richmond. Um, so he was replaced by Attorney General of Louisiana, T.J. Semmes. And Semmes' uh, dedication speech, speech really highlights the fact that this wasn't just a monument to Bartow and his service to the Confederacy, but it was also a memorial to all of the, the Confederate soldiers that lost their lives at Manassas and hopefully a memorial to the triumphant Confederacy, not just at Manassas, but uh, throughout the Civil War. And Semmes really linked um, Bartow's death to the sacrifice needed for the cause of Southern independence, as he put it. And he said, like Bartow, Southerners must rely on your own brave hearts and stalwart arms to achieve the independence of the Confederate States. If the Confederate soldiers are determined to die on the field rather than give up the glorious cause, then the South would be assured glory and success. So in this example, you can see how many individuals throughout the South recognize the meaning of the Bartow Monument and what it stood for, and also the land that it stood on. White Southerners wanted a piece of the Confederacy's first victory, and they gathered relics and mementos from the field of battle uh, to hold that history in their hand. They also left their mark on the monument by chipping away pieces of the, the marble column and etching their names into the stone. A newspaper report from October 1861 stated that the Bartow monument was, quote, not free from the custom of being literally covered with names and pencil, with some scratched on the surface of the stone with nails. And on the slide, you can see another account from two months later, um, from December of 1861, that said the Bartow Monument was covered with the inscriptions of visitors, with not so much space being left as one might cover with his fingernail. So these individuals are, are hoping that First Manassas would be an important historical event in the future of the Confederacy. Um, and small mementos, pieces of the monument, etching their names into it, served as symbols for the independent nation that they were all fighting to create and establish. And pieces of the Bartow monument connected those collectors, those relic hunters, to the sacrifices made uh, to those in the Confederacy as well. Now, I mentioned the fact that this is one of the only images that exists of the Bartow monument um, because it um, fell victim to, to vandalism and destruction in the spring of 1862. Because during that point, um, by the spring, the Confederacy was trying to reverse their season of misfortune. They suffered a series of military defeats um, and it forced them to abandon all of Northern Virginia to protect Richmond the Confederate capital. And so they abandoned Manassas Junction in early 1862, which left it open for the taking uh, by Union soldiers who marched the short distance from Washington, DC to capture that important railroad junction. And once they captured Manassas Junction, many of these soldiers made the, the short march to the old Bull Run battlefield where so many of their comrades had lost their lives uh, the summer earlier. And once they get to the battlefield and they see the shallow graves, um, they hear the desecration rumors of the use of, of Union soldiers' remains as, as relics. Um, they're outraged. And they're also outraged to see a monument to a Confederate commander on the ground where so many of their, their colleagues lost their lives. And this was particularly evident with soldiers in the 14th Brooklyn, many of whom fought 
at First Manassas and saw many of their comrades die. And one Union soldier recalled of this moment, he said the 14th Brooklyn could not relish the vile description upon the Bartow Monument. And after a short time, it had been torn down and the boys were busily at work smashing it in pieces for mementos. Another Union soldier recalled that the Bl Brooklyn Regiment was so exacerbated at the treatment of their fallen companions as to rake the marble monument erected over the remains of the CSESH general. So many of these soldiers took part in First Manassas and they saw this monument to Francis Bartow as a, a symbol of the Confederacy. Um, and so vandalism was used as a way to strike back at the South and change the narrative of the first battle. And relics from the destroyed monument became symbols of success for many of these Union soldiers. As you can imagine, Confederates were pretty outraged uh, to hear of the destruction of this monument. And one Southern newspaper reported that the memorial stone was entirely torn down and quote, the Yankee vandals had broken it into fragments. So while the Bartow Monument stood as a memorial to the slain commander, it also stood as a, a representation of the Confederacy and Union vandalism against it resembled a, an attack against the South and taking back control of, of the battlefield that they just saw um, defeat at. And not a lot of people know about this. Um, when you go to Manassas, you're on Henry Hill. If you're near the, the Stonewall Jackson statue, you know, the big buff Jackson statue there, and you walk down towards um, the post-war Henry House, there's a, a modern day monument to Francis Bartow that was erected by the UDC. And there's a wayside marker there as well. Um, and it sits right next to these two trees. But if you go on to the other side of the trees, you can see at the base, um, the only remains of the Bartow Monument that stood there. Um, so not a lot of people know that. So the next time you, you visit Manassas, um, make sure you, you take a look at that. It's a pretty unique thing to witness and, and realize that that's all that remains of, of the first monument ever dedicated on a Civil War battlefield, um, but it did not survive the Civil War itself. And then another monument um, at Manassas that gets dedicated um, or gets created shortly after the battle is that to a, a private named George T. Stovall. He actually fought under Bartow in the uh, Rome Light Guards or 8th Georgia Infantry, but he was mortally wounded during the early morning fighting on Matthews Hill. So before uh, Bartow gets, gets killed. And in November of 1861, so only a few months after the, the first Manassas battle concluded, Stovall's parents um, commissioned the Richmond firm of J.W. Davies to inscribe a monument to be placed on the battlefield in honor of their son in his service to the Confederacy. And once this monument was completed, um, it was sent from Richmond to Manassas Junction, but it did not reach its in intended destination. Because in April of 1862, once the Union soldiers had uh, taken over Manassas Junction, one soldier noted that the monument was thrown on the side of the tracks near another beautiful marble monument that was broken in pieces, thanks to the American relic rage, as he called it. He presumed Stovall's monument would, quote, soon be broken in fragments and pocketed by those monomaniac relic hunters as well. So he's not too fond of this practice, uh, particularly destroying monuments um, dedicated for, for soldiers who lost their lives. Now, while the date um, of the placement is unknown, Stovall's monument does eventually make it to Manassas. You can still see it today. However, it's gone through um, different placements on the battlefield. You can see it in the bottom right corner there, uh, an early picture of, of some gentlemen standing next to the monument in an open field. Um, and then in the center, the center picture, I don't know if you can make it out, but there's five holes in the top of the monument. And it seems that the monument saw some damage at some point in time, and that very possibly there might have been, a, you know, an additional stone on top of that one that had been lost to history. And this is kind of confirmed in the 1979 report by the National Park Service which stated that the Stovall Monument had been damaged by vandals and its original uh, location on the battlefield was unknown by that point. 
And this report also suggested that the monument should be cemented down to a concrete base to protect it from future damage or even theft, um, indicating that, that this was a really uh, probable uh, threat that the monument faced. And the picture on the left there, that's the what it looks like today. So you can see that it has been cemented down on a concrete base. Um, a lot of individuals like to call it the Salt Lake Monument because it sits uh, on some of the equestrian trails and some of the horses will go up thinking it's a salt lick and be pretty disappointed by that. But it's a pretty new monument as well. One of the earliest um, ever placed on a Civil War battlefield as well. But it's just another example that the threat of vandalism towards Civil War monuments started during the war itself and has continued into the 21st century, something that we're certainly familiar with um, today. Now, Monuments uh, continued to fall under threat throughout the Civil War. This uh, monument is one located in Vicksburg, Mississippi, because in preparation for the 1864 4th of July uh, celebration in Vicksburg, um, the US military wanted to erect a monument uh, to, honor, uh, to honor and commemorate uh, the site where General John Pemberton surrendered to US Grant the year prior. And they needed a monument for this occasion because the original oak tree, which marked the surrender location, had, quote, long since disappeared through the ravages of relic hunters. And so the US Army decided to um, acquire a cast iron fence and white marble shaft around 12 feet high with a large ornamental ball at its top, which is the, the monument you see on the screen there. And what's interesting is this monument that they acquire was actually originally intended to be a Mexican war memorial for the town. But it had laid abandoned in a local stone cutter's yard uh, for years. And so the army thought what well, better than to just reappropriate this um, and make it a, a civil war memorial to, to mark the surrender site. And it's definitely a symbol of, of the United States. Um, on the face of the monument, it was described as having uh, an American eagle sustaining on its wing wings the goddess of liberty. And so you really see how this stood as a symbol for the victorious nation against the Confederates um, who surrendered the city a year prior. However, this monument, like the, the original oak tree, which marked the location, um, came under threat as well. Uh, Article by Harper's Weekly noted that since its dedication, the monument has been defaced and mutilated and the chips and splinters being carried away by those who desire to possess a memento of the memorable event, which it was designed to commemorate. So people are chipping pieces off of this as well. Um, soldiers and civilians kind of in this instance really foresaw the future. They were hoping to hold a piece of the history of the United States months before Robert E. Lee surrendered his, uh, his Army of Northern Virginia at Appomattox Courthouse. And they felt that claiming relics from the monument gave them that opportunity to do so. And this monument, the Surrender Monument, or Grant Pemberton Monument, as it was noted in, in various sources, stood as a literal memorial to Confederate surrender but it also resembled a, a symbolic representation of the United States power in Vicksburg. And its mutilation was also a way for white Southerners to attack the Union, which was something that was not possible once uh, the city was surrendered to the US military. And so these actions by relic hunters and vandals alike left the monument in a poor state and it had to eventually be removed and replaced but uh, part of the original, which you see on the slide there, actually sits um, in the, the National Park Services Visitor Center and Museum. But you can see it, it looks a lot different than, than the picture I showed you on the previous slide. So you can see the ornamental ball on the top has been kind of removed. It looks like there might be pieces chipped away and, and the base of it is, is gone as well. So, just another example of how these soldiers and civilians are, are taking action by, by taking pieces of monuments. Now, another monument um, that kind of gets into the way these, these monuments were used as, as uh, 
pawns in a, a battle over the meaning of democracy and freedom during the Civil War era is, is by looking at the, the monument at Vicksburg, or uh, sorry, at um, Yorktown. So this monument um, played a key role during the uh, 1862 Peninsula Campaign when McClellan marched his Union Army um, up the peninsula to try and capture Richmond. But he was slowed by Confederate fortifications with one anchored at the famous revolutionary battlefield of Yorktown. And here, uh, while soldiers were kind of anchored in and trying to progress towards Richmond, they discovered a 14 foot tall obelisk monument that marked the site where General Cornwallis surrendered to George Washington in October of 1781. This uh, was originally marked by a temporary wooden and plaster victory arch, but a more permanent monument was erected by the Virginia militia in October 19th, 1860. And so this more modern, um, more recent monument was the one that became a site of curiosity for Union and Confederate soldiers alike. So because this monument sort of stood as a symbol of the fight Washington led over 80 years prior, many Civil War soldiers became very interested in, in visiting this and even taking pieces of it. One soldier from the 13th Alabama Infantry mentioned that at Yorktown, Yorktown, we saw many things to remind us of the terrible war between America and Great Britain. The spot where the sword of Cornwallis was surrendered is marked by a monument. Another soldier noted that a favorite place of visitation was the marble slab half a mile from town marking the spot where 80 years before Cornwallis had surrendered to Washington. And just like previous monuments that I've highlighted, uh, this one became a target for soldiers and civilians seeking relics. Um, but this time they wanted to highlight their ties to the revolutionary generation and the sacrifices made in the past. Once a soldier named S.H. Wright from the 2nd Florida Infantry recalled that about a mile from Yorktown is a monument that claims to mark the exact spot on which Cornwallis's sword was surrendered. And relic hunting travelers have in consequence chipped away one large block of marble and are about to make this one disappear. So in this instance, these soldiers wanted to prove that they were the true inheritors of the founding fathers' beliefs, what those soldiers fought for during the Revolutionary War. And they wanted to take pieces of the monument and repurpose them. So on the slide, you can actually see this, this carved ring that was actually made by a Confederate prisoner of war. He took a piece of the marble monument and carved this ring out of it. Um, and I think this is a way to really show the fact that he's using this piece of a monument and repurposing it um, into a memento that can be passed down to future generations. So in some ways, he's not only linking his service during the Civil War to revolutionary soldiers that were there at Yorktown in 1781 to witness the surrender, but he's also using that to link um, service of future generations uh, to the past by repurposing this monument and, and creating new meaning from it, connecting past, the present, and the future in one memento. Now, some soldiers weren't too happy about this practice. Um, the quote that you see on the slide there is written by a private named Robert Seddon from the 40th New York Infantry. He noted that the marble monument erected by Congress to commemorate the surrender of Cornwallis had been broken all up and carried off for relics by either our fellows or the rebels. Only the foundation remained, and if this not been too heavy to carry, would have been taken also by the relic hunting fiend. And another Union soldier was even more direct. Um, he said the monument was, quote, hacked to fragments by the Southerners and carried away piecemeal. So another kind of example of, of how these monuments held significance uh, to these Civil War soldiers and how, you know, this might have been perfectly fine, but now that this war is going on and people are fighting over the, the true meaning of, of democracy and who are the true inheritors of, of the founding fathers' beliefs and democracy as a whole, 
um, they became targets. And this is really seen in the, the monument that John Eric uh, talked about at the beginning here. So the monument battle and the meaning of them continued into 1864. It's in June of that year, General David Hunter marched his approximately 12,000 men into Lexington, Virginia, and they forced the Confederates and Virginia Military Institute cadets uh, to abandon their position and relinquish control of the town to Union occupation. And once there, as I'm sure you're all pretty familiar with, and you can see on the, the top image there on the slide, uh, federal soldiers looted and vandalized VMI before setting it ablaze. And one of the most notable um, trophies taken during the looting of VMI was a bronze statue of George Washington that you see pictured there with some VMI cadets standing in front of it. Many of these Union soldiers, after um, they captured this statue of George Washington, argued that the monument or the statue of him should be removed from the state of Virginia because it was actively fighting to dissolve the Union. And some of his staff officers, General Hunter's staff officers, suggested that the statue should be sent to West Point. Let's take it from the Virginia Military Institute and send it to the United States Military Academy at this point, where it should be rightfully placed. And initially, General Hunter agrees with this. Um, but one of his staff officers suggested instead that the bronze statue of Washington in front of the Institute should be sent to Wheeling by the train as a trophy for West Virginia. West Virginia, of course, being a state created out of the rebellion and really leaving Virginia as a whole. So what better way to, to take a monument that was sitting in Virginia and give it to the state that rebelled against Virginia? And the staff, staff officer explained that Hunter was grieved and indignant to see the statue of George Washington, our great founder, in the hand of a people whose every act and aspiration outraged and insulted his sacred memory. He also explained that Hunter was, quote, most happy to have it in his power to transfer this noble and histor historic work from the keeping of a disloyal people to the loyal state of West Virginia to which it properly belongs. And a colonel in the US Army, whose quote I have on the slide there, mirrored this. He said that while it is true that the men who erected the statue are now dead and in their graves and had nothing to do with the present wicked rebellion, if they had been still living, they would have done just as General Hunter did. And the statue was in the hands of degenerate sons of worthy sires who had no business with it. And this is represented to be the prevailing opinion among the officers and men of the command. So again, this fits into that larger fight, that larger battle between the Union and the Confederacy over the legacy of America's founding father. One Southern newspaper wasn't too happy um, with the taking of the George Washington statue. And it noted that the state of Virginia had erected the statue to her own son, whom she gave to the revolution, which gave birth to the Republic. She was selected, uh, she has selected the spot for its erection where her state military academy was placed to the end that her sons might draw inspiration from his virtues. And another uh, Confederate soldier remarked that the stealing of the statue was an act of vandalism without earthly excuse it is a theft that nothing can palliate, disgraceful to the age and doubly so to the country, which will suffer such a sacrilege to go unwhipped of justice. And even the 1864 annual report by the Virginia Military Institute stated that Union soldiers had robbed the statue and mutilated it in their haste to appropriate and remove it from the military academy. So, these are just a couple more examples of, of how these statues, how these memorials, how these monuments um, really gained prominence as the Civil War was fought. And this battle continued after the Civil War concluded. Um, so I thought we'd go full circle and finish up Manassas as well with, with two more monuments, ones that you're probably familiar with if, if you've ever visited the battlefield. But 
These two monuments were uh, built uh, a couple months after Robert E. Lee surrendered his, his army at Appomattox Courthouse. As Union soldiers made their way back to the battlefields uh, to reclaim the landscape that once saw Confederate success, um, they were tasked with um, burying the dead of Union soldiers and reinterring them in the newly created Arlington National Cemetery. And many of these soldiers, um, many of whom were actually uh, in units of, of heavy artillery units from Pennsylvania, um, were on burial detail in, in nearby Fairfax County. And their job, they were employed in interring the dead of the Bull Run battles, whose bodies had laid uncared for uh, since those battles were fought. And once they made their way to the Bull Run battlefields, they were, they were shocked to see um, the sight of their fallen comrades' bones um, being uncared for for so long. And so on May 28, 1865, it was decided that they would erect two monuments to honor uh, the Union soldiers that died at either first or second Bull Run. And the placement of these monuments was very uh, deliberate. The one you see here on the slide is the monument dedicated to the first Manassas dead. This was placed on Henry Hill, um, only a few uh, yards where Bartow's monument originally stood. This was where some of the heaviest fighting took place during the first battle. And this was similar to um, the second Manassas monument, which was located and, and dedicated and built at the deep cut near the Groveton Woods, which was the deepest part of the Unfinished Railroad, where General Stonewall Jackson's troops took their position against the largest Union assault of the Second Battle. And both these monuments uh, served as markers for the sacrifices made by federal soldiers. As you can see by the picture, um, these were pyramidal shaped monuments that stood approximately 15 feet tall. And they were actually built uh, of red sandstone, which was mined and quarried and um, cut from the local railroad that cut right through the center of the battlefield. So the construction, the material made of these monuments was very purposeful and deliberate as well, connected the memorials to the landscape um, that so saw, my, saw, saw so much devastation. And the monument on Henry Hill was adorned with 200 pound parrot shells that you can see uh, in the picture there. And the plaque on the center stated, in memory of the patriots who fell at Bull Run, July 21st, 1861. The monument at the deep cut, the Groveton Woods, is very similar in its appearance, but instead of parrot shells, it was adorned by artillery shot and shell found on the battlefield nearby. And it's black red in memory of the fallen patriots uh, who fell at Groveton August 28th, 29th, and 30th of 1862. Now, both these monuments um, were given a dedication ceremony that was held on Sunday, June 11th, 1865. Approximately 500 soldiers, civilians, and veterans from Washington, D.C., and Alexandria made their way to the battlefield and were carried there by about 50 ambulances that were appropriated for the occasion. And even generals who fought at Manassas were there, including Orlando B. Wilcox and Samuel P. Heintzelman. And to document the occasion, uh, the famous Civil War photographer, Alexander Gardner was there. And including these individuals uh, were military chaplains. You might be able to see in the picture there, um, towards the left of the screen, the gentleman with the, the white, robes on. Um, these chaplains were there to, to sort of highlight the somber and memorial occasion that these monuments were meant to, to hold. And many of the speeches kind of mirror this and also mirror the ties um, to past conflicts as well. One individual noted that the simple monuments exemplified American principles of democracy and republicanism. While another commander, uh, a veteran of the first battle, stated that this spot will often be visited and the day long remembered, and unborn generations would make pilgrimages to these graves of their forefathers. So very important, very significant. Um, these monuments were, were really highlighting uh, the memorial type occasion um, and the significance of these monuments to US soldiers and veterans. 
These monuments also um, were linking um, their dedication to the causes of the Civil War. And it really highlighted the, the, the destruction of the Confederacy and the institution of slavery in the process. So I have on the slide there um, part of a, a poem or song that was read at the dedication ceremony. So part of it reads, here on Virginia's sacred soil, where slavery bred and drove her gangs, the horrid serpent lay in coil, her freedom's sons first felt her fangs. Slavery may wet her cutthroat's knife or ram down her assassin's ball. The martyr may lay down his life, Seward may bleed and Lincoln fall. But freedom's arm is stronger yet, lifted in earnest for her sons, than is the traitor's bayonet, the murderer's knife, the pirate's guns. And so upon the bloody spot where now this monument is raised, shall rebel bones and memories rot, but patriots' names for A.B. praise. So it's linking union sacrifices and, and praising them eternally in these stone memorials. And this was similar uh, to the monument dedicated at Groveton that you can see pictured on the slide. Uh, that uh, poem reads, this pool of testimonial stones by comrades raised of those who fell over the martyrs gathered bones, says that they battled oh how well. The traitors, captains, and their hordes that glorifying left this fatal ground, where are they now the exalting woods? Of them no monument is found. The slavery shrinks from freedom's rod, however proud, however strong. In his overtime, while God is God, the right shall triumph over wrong. So again, this is a no longer a devastating series of losses for the Union. Um, the battles at Bull Run were, were now seen as small setbacks for the Union on the road to overall victory over the Confederacy during the Civil War. And because these monuments were seen as symbols of defeat for white Southerners, they became prime targets for vandalism. Less than a week after their dedication on June 11, 1865, destruction rumors circulated. One Union soldier recalled that the rebels have destroyed the monuments recently erected on the Bull Run battlefields. And many of those Union soldiers that took part in the dedication ceremony noted that they would destroy every trace of civilization within a circuit of 20 miles of the battlefield if these rumors turned out to be true. And so to, to figure out what was going on, an officer from Washington, D.C. was sent to Manassas to see and check on the monuments and their condition. And he reported that these vandalism rumors were, were in fact false, but they continued to spread across the nation for months after. And as these rumors dissipated over time, um, Southerners were able to leave their mark on the Groveton Monument. In the late summer of 1865, countless civilians began to tour the South to report about the scarred landscape permanently altered uh, by the bloody conflict. And some of them noted that the plaque uh, the cement plaque on the Groveton Monument had been changed. And this one traveler noted that it now read in memory of the Confederate patriots who fell at Groveton. He said that the ill-disposed inhabitants of Manassas mutilated the memorial because it stood as a monument to Northern victory and it demonstrated the power of the United States in the post-war period. And another Northern traveler angrily linked the vandalism of the Groveton Memorial uh, to Confederate soldiers stealing a monument. So they are repurposing it for the Southerners. So white Southerners really kind of use this to transform the meaning of the Groveton Monument to honor their victories and their sacrifices at first and second Manassas. And they also, um, these monuments also became targets for relic hunters as well because all of the shot and shell that adorned the Groveton Monument had been stripped away by relic collectors. And the monument was left bare by 1886. So to kind of conclude here, as you can see in the picture of, of the monument on the screen, um, it became deteriorated over time. And so as the Civil War faded, in the minds and memory for 19th century Americans, the condition of these monuments deteriorated as well, and their meaning began to change. They didn't have as much significance. 
By 1870, only five years after they were dedicated, reports were made that the monuments would soon tumble down if they weren't cared for. And in March of 1879, the army checked on the condition of the monuments and confirmed the Groveton uh, monument had been defaced. And so once at a point, these monuments were at risk of destruction due to vandals, they were now at risk, risk of destruction due to lack of care and neglect. One of the problems that faced these monuments and why they began to deteriorate was the fact that the US didn't own the land that they were uh, standing on. And so Grand Armour, the Republic posts really pushed for the protection and ownership of these lands. This was at the same time when parks like Gettysburg, Shiloh, and Vicksburg were being established. However, Congress argued why they should spend money to preserve a place where the U.S. saw not one but two losses to the Confederates. One congressman even said, we were whipped at Bull Run, and I don't like to vote money for monuments there. However, veterans and civilians remembered the significance and the meaning these monuments had when they were de dedicated, and they began to reach out to Congress to appropriate the funds to preserve them. One veteran uh, wrote a petition titled, Is the U.S. Too Poor to Own Its Own Monuments? And in it, he explained that the memorials at Bull Run needed to be preserved for future generations because out of, quote, all possible sites between the Susquehanna and Rio Grande, the veterans of Appomattox selected Henry Hill for the first monuments to their fallen brothers. And their valuation in the public estimation must continually increase as long as the nation endures. So as a way to conclude, um, put a picture of, of the monument today um, on Henry Hill. And just like this monument and the others I talked about, um, they continued to resonate and connect 19th century Americans to the distant war that was fought and in a way um, preserve the meaning of, of the veterans and the soldiers that fought during that conflict. But ultimately, I, I think my talk highlighted the fact that the political and emotionally charged power of Civil War monuments is not a new phenomenon. And 19th century Americans demonstrated the ways relics could be more powerful than the shot and shell of muskets and artillery. And the battle over the Civil War's meaning was fought through the vandalism, destruction, and collection of the battlefield's memorials and mementos. Thank you. Questions? Yeah. I'm a reader for my question. Uh, in the border state, there's a Coast County down in what is now West Virginia. Mm -hmm. uh, were soldiers from Willstone stand alive? You know? So the question was um, were memorial stones in border states like West Virginia vandalized during the war? And yeah, memorial stones. Um, I don't know of too, in, uh, too many instances. I think recently I was reading an account um, from one of the, somewhere in West Virginia where, or no, I think it was um, an account maybe at Antietam. And I don't know if it happened during the war, it certainly might be possible, but they were talking about pieces of the, the uh, headstones actually being taken. Um, and, and possibly vandalized. But I don't know of too many instances um, during the war, although it might certainly be be the case, but I'm not familiar. Something, to, something I'll have to look into though. Thank you. Yes. In your research, have you found the occupying during reconstruction? Did the federal troops ever rebel at the monuments they saw being raised at that point? I read those descriptions and believe in playing me, that might even a soldier. I didn't know if you read across any evidence on that yet. Yeah, so the question was um, did US soldiers in the kind of post war period um, have issue with Confederate monuments being raised, right? Yeah, and yeah. You know, inscriptions. Yeah, and inscription on them. So I don't have too many instances just because I feel like a lot of the Confederate monuments get placed much later. Uh, especially, I mean, I'm familiar with some of the, you know, the Gettysburg monuments, which I'm sure most people are, are very familiar with. Um, and a lot of those get, get put up. Um, and I think this is the case for a lot of monuments dedicated to the Civil War 
Um, it's really when veterans start dying off um, that a lot of those monuments get put up. So there isn't as much pushback because a lot of those veterans aren't alive at that point. But I do know that once Confederate monuments start getting placed at places like Gettysburg, um, there is a lot of pushback from Union soldiers. Um, and I'm assuming that's the case at, at other battlefields and other locations. But I think like today, there is there is somewhat of a difference whether you know it was a sort of a memorial to you know, unknown soldiers versus, you know, a monument to, to a specific general or something like that. Yeah. yeah. We, to that end, we do have um, in the archives of the SB Post, the resolution that the Post um, published or promulgated that they were patently opposed to the Virginia Memorial at Gettysburg. And they said here that, you know, they're not opposed to marking the Confederate battle lines and things like that, but the, the monumentation of Robert E. Lee at, at that particular spot on the battlefield, they were wholeheartedly against that. We do have that letter here in the archives. Mm -hmm. And I will speak to one other piece that we have in the SP Post, and don't quote me on it, but I think the soldier was Jared Fife. Um, he was, uh, during the war, he was captured and confined at Andersonville Prison. Following the war, he went down to Andersonville, was the first groundskeeper, caretaker of the property after the government had purchased that property. And uh, later retired, moving back up here where he was from, enjoyed the SP Post. And we have a chunk of marble or granite or something there that he had lopped off of the uh, Providence Spring, a monument of the Providence Spring, which is still there. Um, but here you have a groundskeeper, a caretaker, who was defacing a monument himself. And it's, it's been there in the SP Post. It's <laughs> interesting. Any other questions? I need to tell him to ruin uh -huh. Yes, yeah. Yeah, that's one of the earliest right. monuments. No, I haven't seen any case of that. Um, but I am familiar with the monument and I haven't found anything on that, but I'll definitely have to do some more digging. So, like I said, this is a pretty early, uh, I'm pretty early in the stages of research, so who knows what I'll find. I just knew that that was an early monument. Yeah. Which I think it's still um, it's still there at the battlefield, right? Yeah. Yes. What's the status of the Washington Monument of the Bronze? And you said that it was taken. And where did where did it go immediately? Did it go in plan? Where is it still now? So it it remained in Wheeling for the remainder of the war, I believe. And then after the war, um, I think the the governor of of Virginia actually was in a conversation with uh, the governor of West Virginia. And basically a, a agreement was, was made where uh, West Virginia would, would send it back to VMI as long as Virginia paid for the, the cost of, of shipping it back. Um, and it was rededicated. I'm pretty sure the picture, you, you might know, um, the picture that I had on the slide of the cadets, I'm pretty sure that was part of the rededication ceremony that took place after the war. I think it went back and. 1866, I think. Um, but the atmosphere and feeling um, was so so bad at that point. It was so much soot in the air um, that they sent by 1865 or 1866. Uh, the newspaper described the monument as looking like a cigar store in the end. So covered. And so it wasn't in good shape when they sent it back. <laughs> yes, sir. This is a sort of silly question, but you sort of alluded to it. Have, have any of these pieces of the monuments turned up anywhere or people trying to make money off of it or yeah the, i mean the only ones that i know of that uh have definitely turned up is is that ring that i had of the yorktown monument that's at the um but what is the new it's not the confederate uh Treder. yeah the Tredegar, the american civil war museum is that it it's in their collection um so that's a you know a new memento that was kind of created from that monument. So if someone has a bag, or a Ziploc bag in the house with a picture of yeah. no idea why. Yeah, and then I, I know, um, <laughs> I know uh, Jim Burgess, who is uh, the curator at Manassas, he, he's told me that in their collection, I, I think they have some like artillery shells that look like they have, might have some cement on them. And they very well might be the, the ones from the, the Groveton Monument that were taken off there, but uh, hard to actually confirm that.
but yeah, I'm sure there's some pieces out. Um, I'm sure like, you know, any type of little war memorials or mementos that were collected, they got kind of passed down. So who's, who knows? This more of a continued question, and a lot of it has to do with timing, but obviously there's so many so war monuments, but we don't see as many revolutionary war monuments or you know parks dedicated to revolutionary war. Um, why do you think, just in your opinion, why do you think that is? That's a great question. So he asked about um, why aren't there as many revolutionary war memorials or monuments that then how we see so many being dedicated during the Civil War, and I don't know if this is, I guess it's my opinion, but I read this book recently. Um, it's called, uh, it's, I think it's like Civil War Monuments and the Militarization of America by Thomas Brown. And he talks about the fact that um, there isn't really any type of memorialization of, of wars in the United States, uh, specifically because we're kind of branching off and getting away from sort of the traditions of Britain. Um, and so, you know, you think of, uh, you know, the, that famous painting of uh, them toppling the George III statue in New York after the reading of the, the Declaration. So you don't really have this memorialization in the U.S., um, but once the Civil War is over, a lot of these individuals want to honor um, the, the death of their comrades in the war. And then you also see the establishment of GAR posts and, and memorial halls like soldiers and sailors and ways to kind of get the, the community involved in honoring veterans as well. And then once the US becomes more militarized um, and these veterans start dying off, they wanna honor them themselves. And that's when you start seeing that kind of third era of, of civil war monuments being dedicated with more generals being in place and, and unit uh, monuments and things like that. So I think it's just kind of a, a changing sort of idea of, of where the U.S. was and, and honoring that militarization and having a standing army, um, you know, because the U.S. was very kind of against that and only having militia units and things like that in the past. Yes. Yeah. Some of you might be heard already, but a group of one at Saratoga. Oh, yeah, yeah. Park, mm -hmm. park to uh, <laughs> he, right. He, he went to the wedding and his major traitor. Years and years later, they got a group of one. Yeah. You have a question, ma'am? It wasn't a question, but I just wanted to mention that the uh, American Battlefield Trust, that was used to be called Senator. American Battlefield Trust in Washington began a project about two years ago to build a database of monuments on federal land. So, of course, the, the biggest is the Civil War. Right. And I've been working on Vicksburg for mm -hmm. two years. <laughs> There's over 1,600 miles of Vicksburg. But they're publishing these. So, if you go on their website, you should be able to find them. But it, it lists the monument, um, who the spots for the monument, what it's the material that it's made out of, what it's dedicated. Um, and if we can find dedicated speeches, you know, we put the URL in there. But they also cover um, the American Revolution and War of 1812. Wow, that's really It's an ongoing project, but it's it's being in mind. It's a great database. That sounds amazing. Uh, you have a question, man. I think it needs to be mentioned that um, into the Jim Crow, the Southern support of monuments, the purpose of the are familiar with that. Mm -hmm. You might mention that. I just learned about that recently. Yeah, that's a really great point. Thank you. Yeah, it definitely highlights, you know, kind of an extension of, of what I talked about as well. So it's a really great point. Yes, sir. Were you happy to say what it was? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, well, I mean, in a lot of ways, once uh, Jim Crow and Reconstruction starts taking hold, um, putting these monuments up to Confederate commanders and, and also to you know Confederate units was a way to take back power um, and, and show that, that power that white Southerners had over African Americans um, once they started gaining more, more rights and, and, and the idea of 
that they're going to be subliminally introduced idea of slavery to bring for a state's right mm -hmm. as a justification. Yeah, and it, it goes back to your earlier point too, sir, where you know you asked about are people outraged over, over these monuments getting dedicated and you know all of these Confederate monuments, they were particularly um uh you know, the black black individuals were not happy with with these monuments being dedicated from the very beginning, even though their voices might not have been the the majority heard. Just a comment: that there's a new book out on World War II monuments in Europe. It's all about victimization, victims, and America. It's about crime and how do you perceive the victims in Europe and crime okay. in America. Wow, that's interesting. Hey, one thing that caught my ear was, uh, I can't remember the detail, but the, uh, there was a quote there where they said, we don't look here, we didn't want to mm -hmm. find for it. I, I lived in Chattanooga before I moved back on there. And if you go to Lookout Mountain, there's a very large, there's really a small, above Chattanooga, there's a very small area there. Uh, there's a rather large New York monument. And every time I go to there, someone says, <laughs> Yeah, great point. Do you have any Zoom questions? We do not have any Zoom okay. questions. Yeah, uh, we do have people still online. Um, so we'll have another round of applause for Abby and that <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for coming out. Don't forget, next month, uh, March 11th, a month from today, keep an eye out a few days before to find out who we can hear for the music hall. I uh, will have signs posted, and we do end up the music hall if you want to see us here. Uh, otherwise, anyone who's interested in Soviet the front symposium, you know, in the app. And thank you for coming. Okay. Well, I have not been here on years ago. I've been on the